we are in for a really good treat. Mark Johnson is an associate professor with the University of Notre Dame's Alliance for Catholic Education. In this role, Johnson partners with middle and high school social study teachers who serve in Catholic schools across the country. In his history interests, Mark focuses on the Chinese experience in his home state of Montana. Previously working in Shanghai, Mark brought students with the necessary language abilities to Montana to translate several collections of documents from the state historic Chinese uh, residents to work to tell their story in their own words. And I was here when that happened and it was amazing. So please join us in welcoming Mark Johnson. Good. good evening, good evening. Is that Mike picking me up? We, we good? Just want to thank Deb and the Montana Historical Society. They've been such great partners in hosting events like this. And as she mentioned, when we found the documents, from Montana's historic Chinese communities and then work to translate those to tell this story. So they've been amazing partners. I want to thank John and Suzanne with Lewis and Clark County Library. Just a wonderful venue and a great turnout on a Tuesday, chilly Tuesday night here in Helena. As Deb mentioned, I, I am a professor for the University of Notre Dame. So I'm full, fully employed by them, but I live in Montana full time and I do most of my work out in California. So I'm kind of, kind of all over the place. But this is my hobby, working with the Chinese history of Montana. I've been doing it for about 12 years, as Deb mentioned. I used to teach in Shanghai, China, and that allowed me to marry my academic year, 10 months out of the year, plus my two months every summer back here in Montana, bring those stories together in what I hope are, are interesting and exciting ways. So this is the book that I came out with in, in May. Speaking of kind of Chinese New Year and Lunar New Year and things like that, the, the terminology is important. It is a Lunar New Year festival celebrated by many different Asian communities. For the purposes of tonight, I will be referring to it as Chinese New Year because that's the community that I'm investigating. But in terms of Chinese New Year cycles, I'm a year of the tiger and we just finished the year of the tiger. And so my book came out during my year of the tiger. I felt it was like great uh, prosperity for, for this. I've been working on this for 10 or 12 years. And what I seek to do in the book is two things tell the history of Montana's Chinese communities whenever possible in their own words through translation of close to 300 letters like this that were found at the Montana Historical Society, donated from Butte's Maywa Society. And so there, there are two individuals working in Butte, but thankfully they're preserved and housed here at the Montana Historical Society. And when I came across these collections in 2010, uh, I talked to the researchers, the wonderful researchers at the Montana Historical Society and said, has anybody ever translated these? And they said, well, no, we don't know anybody who reads Chinese. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I know a few people who read Chinese because I was living in Shanghai. It wasn't that easy. There's a long story. It's told in the introduction to the book. But there had been one attempt to translate these into English. It was by a, a Catholic priest who was of Chinese ethnicity working at the University of Montana. And he gave a cursory reading of three of the letters and said, they deal with family affairs, they are of no historical importance. He was right on the first count. And my book argues that he was wrong on the second count, but that these family connections and southern China, Guangdong province, Taishan County, and the, the, the difficult circumstances that families were going through there, and the life-saving earnings that families could make here in Montana as restaurant workers, as laundry workers, as gardeners, as miners, as railroad workers, but this global connection linked Montana with Southern China, and I, I hope I, I tell it in interesting ways in the book. And then also to try and tell the history of Montana's Chinese community through various lenses. I think you have to know world history, you have to know Chinese history, and you need to know Montana history to tell this story well. You need to know where Depuyer is, you need to know where Nyhart is, and things like that. So being from Montana, plus with that Chinese experience, I hope that I was able to do that well. The book will be on sale tonight after the talk. It is an academic book. It's an, from an academic press. I've heard that it's very readable. I agree with those assessments. Uh, but what I, my point is, it, it does tend to be a little pricier sticker price. It's $55, but tonight we've got the added benefit that there is a free copy of the most recent, one of the most recent Montana, the magazine of Western histories, as you'll see back there, with a brand new uh, article that I wrote about a different aspect of the Chinese story. So you buy the book tonight, you get that supplement, and you go home ready to read. 
okay? So, the history of Chinese communities in Montana. Yes, there was a large Chinese presence in Montana. A large Chinese presence in Montana at one point in time. 1870, Helena had more than 20% of its population was Chinese. And then you see a precipitous decline across the state. The population peaked in 1890 at over 2,500. These are probably somewhat undercounted as some Chinese in the American West were here under less than legal means trying to circumvent the Chinese Exclusion Act, which were racially motivated. And so they were trying to get around that. So they might have avoided the census enumerator. But in terms of counting the state's Chinese population, this is as close as we can get. Yeah. Sure. Chinese Exclusion Act went into effect in 1882. And sometimes it's misunderstood that it was trying to bar all Chinese from coming in. It was very specifically against Chinese workers. Students, diplomats, merchants could come in. Priests could come in at one point in time. But then every 10 years, the Chinese Exclusion Act was up for review and was always reasserted and, in fact, sadly strengthened. And so for, I mentioned priests. By 1892, priests, Chinese priests could no longer come in. Now, the Chinese Exclusion Act would be in effect from 1882 until 1943. Long period of time, and really the only piece of legislation that so specifically targeted an ethnic group, a national group, a community like that. And so it, it was difficult to get into America as a Chinese person, and difficult to reside here if you did get in. Okay. But I, I wanted to break these numbers down a little bit further and not just give territorial statewide numbers. And so I, I did a map that showed when each Chinese population was at its height and what it was at that height. The color coding tells you what year, and you don't need to worry about that so much. But you can see our home city of Montana, I'm sorry, Helena, had almost 700 Chinese in 1870. Okay. Butte had close to 1,000. Again, that number is at 841, probably an undercounting, so I'm rounding up just a bit. Butte had a massive Chinese population. Helen had a massive and important Chinese population. But I wanted to go even further. So that's just counting 70 or above. Let's go from 10 to 69. Spread all across Montana. Let's go even below 10. So the Chinese literally were all across Montana, with one exception. Tragically, my home city of Great Falls was the only city, only town in Montana that proactively prevented the Chinese from settling. The first Chinese person to settle there was a gentleman named George Wong, who came from Helena, born in Helena, thus an American citizen, tried to go to Great Falls to start a restaurant, and the city council in 1938 had to meet and decide if they were going to let George Wong into the city to make a restaurant. So difficult to be Chinese in Montana. The locations I'm going to reference today are specifically, as you can see here, Bozeman, Livingston, out to Billings, Virginia City, Anaconda, Helena, okay? and that tiny little dot of Nyhart, Montana, right? How many of you have been to Nyhart? Yeah, if you've been up to Showdown Ski Area and you come the, that one way, right? But I want to go further than this. I, I want to look not just at these numbers, state totals or territorial totals, or even where they were. I want to try to get to an understanding of the culture, their experiences, and their cultural practices. For our purposes tonight, I'm going to be focusing on those cultural practices. Yeah? Are these maps in your book? They are. I think pages seven and eight, six or seven, right? I, I, it was hard to capture that because that map that I feature, and it was created with a cartographer and I had collaborating back and forth, I didn't want to give a series of maps that said, okay, in 1870, here's where they were, 1890. I wanted to try and do all three things together. Demographically, how large was the population? Geographically, where were they? And chronologically, when was that population at its height? So I'm, I'm very proud of that map and the, the work that went into it to try and tell the story. In fact, this map here is the one that's in there. And so I wanted to look at, for tonight, how the Chinese community in Montana maintained cultural continuity, kept Chinese cultural practices alive in a tragically often hostile environment. How did they do this? What did it look like? Was it dangerous to do this? Uh, because to celebrate these somewhat foreign customs to an Anglo-European rest of Montana, non-native population, brought attention. And with that attention could come anti-Chinese rhetoric, possible anti-Chinese attacks and violence. So just keeping Chinese cultural practices alive could indeed be potentially dangerous. 
So here we have a picture that I published in the book. It's the first time this picture has been, been published. Uh, it's from the 1890s. What do you think's going on here? Funeral, good. For Chinese culture from southern China, the culture of the color of death is white. And you can see this funeral procession going from downtown Missoula out to the rattlesnake area where there was a Chinese cemetery. But look at the onlookers. There wasn't a very large Chinese community in Missoula. And so when they practiced their cultural traditions, they gained a, lot, a great deal of attention. And funerals had attendant wailing and gongs and music and certain types of paper that were strewn about. So to attract that attention could also attract the attention of anti-Chinese forces in the state. On that issue of cultural practices, funerals were an important part of that. And I feature this in chapter six. I go into great depth about Chinese burial and funeral practices uh, across the territory in the state. And you can see here's an article from Billings that's talking about burial. And then what would happen is that the remains would reside in the ground for five to seven years. And then bone pickers would exhume the remains for return and reburial in southern China so that the de deceased could be venerated by ancestors, by descendants. Okay? So that was a very important part, but again, quite foreign to non-Chinese Montana culture, and it could attract unwanted attention. In fact, across Montana, there are four cemeteries that have Chinese tombstones in them. That top right is from Billings Mountain View Cemetery. The bottom is from Butte's Mount Moriah Cemetery. And the top left is just outside of Helena's Forest Vale Cemetery in what's called China Row. And I've got a project that's building from the book to try and look at and translate these Chinese characters and try to identify what the characters say, who the individual was, and where the home village was. This is currently being founded by the Montana History Foundation, so I need certain people with language abilities, and we secured those from the University of San Francisco, to translate and now geographically try to locate and hopefully connect with extended families from southern China who have some memory or some documents of one of their family members coming to Montana. It's a good question. That, that will come up a little bit later. It wasn't cheap. Um, and it was, depending on kind of what organizations you belong to, it was kind of a death benefit that you would almost pay into organizational dues. And then when you passed away, that would be taken care of by the dues that you'd been paying through your time in America. Yeah, good question. I don't know the actual specific amount, and that would have changed across time, of course. Dues back to an organization in China? Back to an organization here one of the Tongs or one of the, the family organizations or native place organizations. If you're from a certain county, then countrymen from that same county would gather together for strength and camaraderie, but also for taking care of things like that. Yeah. If you'd like to take part in this and, and, and venerate and, and be part of the continued remembrance of the Chinese history of Montana, Butte is a great place to do that. I think we could do a little bit better job in Helena as well. But every spring, Butte hosts the Qingming or Tomb Sweeping Festival, where it's just like it sounds. The graves are cleaned, um, incense is burned. It's, it's a respectful way to try and honor that Chinese legacy. Now, it's going to be in May this coming year. That doesn't line up with when it should be. It should be earlier in April. But if we did it in April, it'd be snow shoveling day instead of tomb sweeping day. So Butte's May Wa Society always shifts it back just a little bit. But that's definitely one way to get involved if you're interested. Now, being Chinese in Montana was not easy. This was some of the type of vitriol and the diatribes and the rants against the Chinese community in Montana from the Fort Benton record in 1878. No one objects to the Chinese because of their color, race, or creed. I, I kind of think they did. There was a lot of racist animosity and cultural animosity against Montana's Chinese population. The objection to them is they remained to the end what they were when they landed, Chinese. Europeans are welcome here because they assimilate and become part of the nation, but it's different with these Chinese residents coming in. I will not put my mouth around some of the more racist terminology. You can see it in the primary sources there, but I don't think that's something that we should do in 2023. But it's different with the Chinese. Whatever territory they occupy, they convert into a little strip of Asia, and you can see the rest. Shall we continue to invite this tapeworm into our entrails? Quote, unquote, my goodness, right? When an immigrant comes to this country, he must be, come to be an American. 
And if he doesn't intend to become one, then he ought to be made to stay away. And this was four years before the enactment of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Now, the thing was, if you're a European immigrant who comes to America, yeah, you could become an American citizen. What's that process called? Naturalization. Okay? Chinese were not allowed to become naturalized citizens. And so this person saying they don't become, the laws have not allowed it. The only way for somebody of Chinese ethnicity to gain American citizenship was to be born on American soil. But even that was made intentionally difficult. In 1900, the ratio of Chinese men to Chinese women was 40 to 1. Okay. So it was made intentionally difficult for Chinese families to become Chinese American families. Now you might say, well, do they have to intermarry with only Chinese people? By law in Montana, yes. From 1909 to 1953, Chinese were not allowed to marry outside of their race. And yet there were a, a tiny few number of Chinese women. Sometimes you'll hear that the sending culture of the Chinese culture did not want and did not allow women to go out. That's somewhat true. But other places they went out to at the same time period, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, had a closer gender balance than the skewed ratio in America. And the politicians passing those acts of legislation said very much so that they didn't want Chinese families to become Chinese American families. Merchants could bring in a wife, and so there were some Chinese families who became Chinese American families, but it was made intentionally very difficult. So this harangue here, it's hard for the Chinese in Montana or the American West to meet this criticism because of the laws and the culture that's, that's stacked up against them. And European immigrants kept parts of their culture alive as well, right? I go to the Montana State Fair, I get a Viking, right? I, I, you keep parts of the culture alive, and yet if they came to keep those parts of the culture alive, it could be so off-putting to the dominant culture. And so here's where we get into the first mention of Chinese New Year being affected by this. This is from the Anaconda Standard talking about Anaconda's Chinese community. And it said, all on the dead quiet. China New Year will not be observed in Anaconda this year. That's unusual. That's unusual. The reason is the handful of Chinese who remain in the city seem to be thankful that they are able to live here and don't want to call attention to their presence by any demonstration. They knew that to rise up and celebrate was possibly dangerous because in Anaconda you can see the string of harassment, attacks, and anti-Chinese actions that had just taken place. There had been an explosion, possibly a terrorist-based explosion that had killed three Chinese laundry workers in 1885. There had been a boycott in 1885. That's a year that comes up over and over again. 1885 was a particular dangerous year to be Chinese in the American West. Sadly, down in Rock Springs, Wyoming, in September 1885, about 30 Chinese coal miners were murdered. Out in Tacoma, the Chinese were expelled. Out in Seattle, the Chinese were expelled. Here in Montana, there were boycotts across the territory to try and expel Montana's Chinese population. There was one place that stood up against that and said, no, we're not going to allow that to happen. That's in Deer Lodge, Montana. And I tell about that in the article that you can get for free after purchasing the book. <laughs> Nobody else is going to push your product for you. Okay. But even the Chinese in Anaconda that had declined because of this harassment and these attacks still worshipped. They worshipped somewhat silently. In the establishment, the God of love, war, and prosperity makes peace, makes his home in one corner of the laundry. So this is the temple, one tiny corner of a Chinese laundry in Anaconda. The Anaconda Joss. Now that word Joss, you'll hear a lot when referencing Chinese cultures in the American West. It's thought that it's a kind of a conglomeration and pidgin language between Portuguese and the Portuguese had missionaries working in southern China in the 16th century and the Portuguese word for God is Dios and so that kind of transmogrified into the word Josh for anything religious for the Chinese so they would this newspaper would refer to the Chinese statue of the gods as the Josh or the temple would be the Josh or Joss house Incense would be joss sticks. Ritual paper that you burn to make offerings to the deceased ancestors would be joss paper, things like that. So the anaconda joss is not a very pretentious god, yet he receives much reverence. In the anaconda, he is merely a gaudy colored picture of an almond-eyed heathen. 
So a picture in the corner of a laundry serves the Anaconda community as our temple. But they continued to worship, even though they knew if they worshiped too loudly and boldly, it could draw unwanted attention. Speaking of the Joss House or the Josh House or the temple, this is a picture from the temple, the Chinese temple from Virginia City, Montana, which had a very large Chinese population early in the territorial settlement. And this was a time when Chinese who came here were usually involved in plaster mining, sluicing and panning for gold. Okay. Pretty quickly into the territory's development, the Chinese were pushed out of that economic niche and then occupied laundry work, restaurant work, garden work. Yeah. Did the Yeah, they definitely worked as railroad workers. And this is where it got confusing uh, for the, the, the intent of the legislation. In the 1860s, there was something called the Burlingame Treaty because the American West is resource rich and labor poor. So to build the Transcontinental Railroad across the Sierra Nevadas, they needed workers. The Burlingame Treaty opened the doors of America to Chinese workers to come in and build this railroad. 1868, they were welcomed in and treated with most favored nation status. And then a couple years later, the doors were closed. So you could see why Chinese who had been welcomed in at one point in time for their labor on this backbreaking task, after the doors are closed, found ways to get around that. In Montana, they absolutely helped build the railroads um, from the 1880, late 1880s through the early 1890s. Yeah. But in terms of the most occupation that they served in in Montana was usually laundry work, garden work, restaurant work with a few merchant families. Yep. So this is the temple in, in Virginia City, but temples could also be a site of attack. This talks about an attack that happened in Billings where the uh, worshipers were very rudely treated by some rowdies in Billings. Why do you think anti-Chinese forces often targeted Chinese temples. What do you think anti-Chinese forces often attacked with arson or vandalism or robbery or handling the worshipers? What do you think that was important to anti-Chinese forces? This is the moment when I'm going to take a drink and kind of rest my breath a little bit. You can turn and talk to somebody close to you. Why do you think temples were such a tar frequently target of attack? Go ahead. It's like cornerstone of their culture. Cornerstone of their culture, absolutely. What else? That's where they'd congregate. If you were trying to find a Chinese force to do harm against, that's where they tended to be. Yeah. What else? It wasn't Christian. It was so different. So different. Not Christian. Okay. So it stood against what was being put down here by settler colonials in Montana, saying this is what we value. It was so different, seemingly, that it was a target of attack. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now... This happened in Billings. You can see the size of the Billings Chinese community never got more than 100. Okay, so maybe they were like easily targeted because of the small Chinese population. In Butte, with 1,000 Chinese residents in 1891, this is a Sanborn fire insurance map, and you can see the, the Joss house right here taking up two lots. So it's got a very large Chinese community do you think that it will be targeted as much as a community like Anaconda that had a much smaller Chinese population or Billings that had a much smaller Chinese population? Would there be strength in numbers for Butte's Chinese? People were scared, okay. It's difficult to say either way. This is that temple. So here's the Joss house. This is a picture of that temple. And there's a very interesting uh, interview that was done by the temple keeper, the, the priest, so to speak. He was a guy who, when the interview happened, he claimed to be 107 years old. It's a fascinating interview. I don't know if I believe that he's 107 years old. He might have been having some fun at the expense of the reporter. But he talked about the evolution of the Chinese temple in Butte. And he said, at first, we had a little joss, just like the head made out of a piece of log, a, a temple to the gods, right? A statue to the gods. Next, he made a larger one. It didn't have any arms or legs. Ten years ago, in 1889, we made this fine, big joss with outstretched arms, beautiful face and legs. And you can hear his pride at the temple god statue that inhabited this Chinese temple. Sadly, though, the only reason we have a picture of this is because it was reported in the newspaper that the Chinese temple had been vandalized. 
So even with that large Chinese population, they were not free from anti-Chinese attacks and vandalism. And in fact, that, God that, he, that statue of the god that he was so proud of was desecrated and destroyed. Three gods were permanently retired from business when a man whose brain was filled with devils broke into the Chinese temple, the Chinese Josh house. At an early hour this morning, two prayer rugs were also desecrated. The article claimed never in all of the history of the Chinese in Butte has anyone dared to violate the temple, the Chinese temple. This has never happened before. Never any vandalism, robbery attacks, anything like that. A little bit of sleuthing tells us that that's not true. In 1885, again, 1885 was not a good year. Rowdies broke down the door, broke the lock into the temple, and attacked the building. In 1885, it almost went up in smoke with attempted arson. And in 1899, precious religious artifacts were stolen as well. So it was a frequently targeted area. Now, the Chinese in Butte maybe then should keep their head down and not celebrate so openly. They didn't. They made a new temple god statue. This is a picture from the temple after that time period. And you can see it's black and white, but that temple god is right here, the statue to the temple god. It was actually crafted and imported from China in 1905. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. This is what it looks like today. And if you visit the Meiwa Museum in Butte, it's still there. And so to persevere throughout those attacks and still say, no, our worship, our cultural traditions are important enough that we're not going to bend to this attack was important for the Chinese in Butte. Now, the Chinese temple keeper is that guy, the guy Wong Ken Chung is the guy who said he was 107 years old, and, uh, but he was the, the temple keeper at the time period. Later, uh, somebody did a study of the Chinese temple and said, at the temple in Butte, the temple keeper assists the supplicants, the worshipers, with religious offerings, burning of joss sticks, lighting of candles, pouring of wine before Guangdi's altar, and burning of paper spirits. But not all Chinese communities had a priest or a temple keeper or somebody whose job it was to look after their religious uh, worships. Religious leaders in 1880, there were only two that rose on the census of 1880 as priests, and it got even more difficult after that. Immigration restrictions, the 1892 Gary Act, again, the reassertion of the Chinese Exclusion Act, narrowed who could come in. In 1892, it was made illegal for Chinese priests or temple keepers to come into America and serve the communities like that. And I do think that was out of the intent, again, going back 20 minutes ago, of intentionally trying to make it difficult for Chinese families to put down roots and become Chinese American families. If you could make it as difficult as possible to put down roots and establish a cultural foothold here, maybe they would go back to China, thought the anti-Chinese forces. But in 1905, there were temple keepers listed in Livingston, Bozeman, Missoula, Billings, and Helena. And so they persevered. Yet with or without a temple keeper, if there was a community of a thousand or a community of one, they're going to keep their cultural traditions alive. And for our purposes tonight, the most important of those term, uh, uh, traditions is Chinese New Year. Okay. Chinese New Year is a lunar festival celebrated by many different Asian cultures. It's called Spring Festival. It's called Lunar New Year. Again, for our purposes tonight, since I'm only looking at the Chinese experience in Montana, I'll refer to it as Chinese New Year as it was at that time period. And a newspaper reporter tried to translate the importance of Chinese New Year to the non-Chinese readers. I think he did a pretty good job. The Chinese takes his Fourth of July, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's all in one week instead of distributing them about throughout the year. So the most important festivals for non-Chinese people are, I would say, you missed one. Uh, Teacher Appreciation Day, I think, should also be, <laughs> be in there, right? Um, but the most important things throughout the year for the Chinese, it's within this two-week span of holidays. I think he captured that pretty well. What he couldn't know and what non-Chinese people in Montana couldn't know is how heartbreaking it must have been for Chinese in Montana to be so far away from family. It's a key cultural imperative to gather with family at the beginning of Chinese New Year to feast, to reconnect. That might be the one time in the year that the whole family's together. But for these men, mostly men working in Montana, to get back together with family in southern China was almost an impossibility. And yet they gathered as countrymen to try and keep that cultural continuity alive. And so, what should we expect? For those of you who know a little bit about Chinese New Year, Chinese culture, what type of things should we hear about when Chinese New Year is being celebrated? The dragon. The dragon? Yep. Dragon dance and? Dragon 
fireworks, def dragon dance and lion dance, okay? I didn't see any reference to that in the dozens of references that I saw to Chinese New Year in Montana. I think that maybe is a later addition in Chinese cultural practices, in, at least in, in North America. Very important now, if you look at Oakland, California, San Francisco, California, Seattle, Butte, Montana, the dragon dance is important, okay? I didn't see any reference to that. Firecrackers, I definitely saw a reference to. What else should we see reference to? Food, feasting, absolutely, absolutely. Anything else? Good luck money, yeah, and the issue of debts. So we hear a lot in the records about settling your debts before New Year, so that you wanna start fresh, the old cycle is done, the new cycle begins, and you can start with a clean slate. The good luck money is a little bit more for children, and there, sadly there weren't many Chinese children, Chinese American children in these communities. Uh, so fireworks, absolutely, debts, cleaning, cleaning before the new year begins, to clean everything old away and start fresh. And so we see references to that in the white written newspaper articles about this Chinese tradition. Sadly, from the period 1870, 80, 90s, we don't have any Chinese voices that speak to these traditions, but we can infer from what the white newspaper writers are writing about it, how they see them scrubbing things down. And they're being so attentive to cleanliness which anti-Chinese forces would have claimed was not a part of Chinese culture, right? But so attentive to cleanliness before the new year rang in. And then when the fireworks go off, they, the newspapers also noted that they didn't clean up the fireworks wrappers. Do you know why? You don't want to do that right away because you're going to be sweeping away fortune. Yeah, you want to let that, you've, you've, you've scared away the ghost with the fireworks, you want to let that linger, and then you'll sweep it away a week or two afterwards. If you sweep it immediately, you're sweeping fortune out the door. And so the white-controlled newspapers commented on this without the cultural understanding that we can now apply to what they were perceiving. And so here we see in Livingston, tables were spread with all manner of curious curiosities and most Chinese delicacies. So absolutely feasting was an important part. Good question. Did the Chinese establish and maintain newspapers of their own? In San Francisco, absolutely. Here they did. I saw a, an 1866 reference to a Chinese newspaper um, in an article about the Chinese community in the 1890s, but I've never found any mention of it. Now, this is actually what got me started on the, the, the goose chase that help these Chinese documents surface. Because in China at the time, and even now, a lot of times a newspaper is put up on the wall as a community experience. So newspapers will be plastered up and then people come through and read them. And so I thought to myself, maybe the Montana Historical Society has a copy of this Chinese newspaper, but doesn't even know what it is, right? But it has not surfaced today. I've seen one reference to it. There were Chinese newspapers published out of San Francisco that the Chinese in Montana were reading. Good question. Okay. So we see the feasting with the Chinese community in Livingston. Here we see the fireworks in Bozeman in 1884, firecrackers, and drink rice whiskey and abandon the wash tub and lie, stop. And actually that is important. After the New Year's rung in, you don't wash for a day or two because you want to hold on to all of that prosperity that has come with the ringing in of the New Year. Okay. Here we see in Bozeman. And it says, you know, the Chinese community, they have the firecrackers, the whiskey, the Chinese of Bozeman are becoming pretty well thinned out, not by boycott or violent means, however. This claims that they're being supplanted by white women taking the laundry jobs and the restaurant jobs. And that was a continual tension. But Bozeman's Chinese community was not terribly large, and yet it makes its, its way into these references a number of times about celebrating openly, loudly, very loudly with the firecrackers, uh, the the traditions. And so to maintain this cultural connectedness, this continuity with the culture, even when it could have been dangerous, shows how important it was, but also shows how strong they were, communally and, and culturally and spiritually, to keep this. But it, it highlighted their differences, possibly. Okay. I like this source. I just found this a couple of days ago in preparation for this talk. It's from Dupuyer. Tuesday was the Chinese New Year, and De Puyer's lone representative of the Chinese Empire kept open shack and entertained all comers with the choice decoctions emanating from the land he came from. Okay, and it references the queue, the hairstyle that they were forced by Chinese politics to wear. But the one Chinese guy in De Puyer has a Chinese New Year party, and it looks like he wants to invite some other people to, to experience that as well. And so I started going down this path. 
Was this closed off and only experienced and appreciated and enjoyed by Chinese Montanans, or did they open their doors to non-Chinese Montanans? And it turns out they were pretty welcoming. The first reference I saw in 1866 from uh, Virginia City, having been invited most hospitably to partake of cigars, sweetmeats, and wine, we, the white newspaper reporters, retired with our company, duly impressed with the august ceremony. So white reporters were invited to take part in these delicacies as well. And it continued up here in Helena, 1869. Whatever may be said, and this is an interesting one, because the person begrudgingly acknowledges their, the Chinese uh, hospitality. Whatever may be said against the Chinese or their peculiar customs, they're at least entitled to the credit of being generously hospitable, I guess, on their festival days. Yesterday, they were honored by congratulatory calls from a large number of the male residents of Helena. And the same reference, 1869. Today, the Chinese of Helena will, in common with their brethren throughout the whole wide world, open their houses and extend to their people their hospitality with a generous hand. You who desire, you readers of this newspaper who desire to witness the manners of this people upon the greatest of their national days will be welcome. Come down and experience it. And so they were not closed off. They were arms wide open to welcome their non-Chinese neighbors to take part in these festivals. That's generally speaking. I also notice this very specifically in three locations. In Helena, in Butte, and in Bozeman. These three individuals, we've got detailed accounts of them opening their doors and hosting non-Chinese visitors to Chinese New Year celebrations. And so we see in Bozeman, this gentleman here, invite, he's a restaurateur, invited county and city officials and prominent businessmen and women. They had never partaken of Chinese delicacies before, but found them delightful and in generous quantity. But just in case maybe it wasn't to their tastes, <laughs> an American, full American turkey dinner after that. And this is at a time when Bozeman's Chinese population was only about 12 or 13. So this Chinese restaurateur is opening his doors to these people who have never partaken in it before. In Butte, this gentleman here, Dr. Hui Pak, had come to Butte in 1890, so he hasn't been there that long. And he gave an elaborate dinner for New Year to a number of American friends. Here's what he served. Bird's nest soup, shark fin, abalone, jellyfish, octopus. 13 courses, right? And the type of people who made the guest list, both to Dr. Hui Pak and to Chin Aban, in Bozeman were people like this. What do you think might be going on? PR. Inviting the mayors. Sorry? PR campaign. PR campaign. Becoming interconnected with important people in the non-Chinese community because you never know when you need to call on them. And so it's trying to cultivate some relationships outside of the Chinese community. And in fact, later that same year, in 1896, Dr. Hui Pak needed to call on these connections. Because in 1896-97, there was a major boycott against Butte's large Chinese community to try and push the Chinese out of Butte. And Dr. Hui Pak and others fought this boycott in the American court system, a rather bold move. And I think, I can't prove it, but I think Dr. Hui Pak probably called in some favors from the connections he'd been cultivating for some time. And Butte's Chinese community circulated a petition with more than 300 people signing it saying, yes, we want to fight this boycott, and they won in the American court system. So a very bold move, a very bold stance. Here closer to home in Helena, we have a guy named Dr. Uh, Tong Hing. Now, Helena's Chinese community was beset by problems from the very start. In 1866, there was an attempted boycott of Chinese laundries in Helena to try and force them out. And this is very early in Chinese development. There had already been, been more than a dozen Chinese laundries. And in 1866, anti-Chinese forces says, we don't want to do business with them at all. And anybody who does business, we're going to boycott you too. Let's push the Chinese out of Helena. The Chinese in Helena actually wrote an, an op-ed piece in the newspaper and said, hey, we just want to earn an honest living by the sweat of our brow. We want to be good citizens, even though we know that they couldn't become citizens. But we're following all your laws. We pay all our taxes. Just let us reside here and work. And so they were allowed, but it was tenuous. In 1870, a Chinese man 
kind of just about where we're here now in the library. This happened, um, where Chinatown used to be. He shot a white man, killing him in an altercation, the circumstances of which are still under uh, mystery. Okay. He came home one night. His version was, the white man's version was, he was walking by a Chinese cabin at 10.30 on a Saturday night and heard a disturbance and so went in and found this Chinese man assaulting a woman and accosted him for doing that. The Chinese man left and got a gun and shot the white guy who'd come into his cabin. The Chinese guy's version was, I came home and found this white guy in my cabin assaulting my woman, and I took what action many Montanans would agree with still to this day. Debatable, but in this whole tussle, Tong Hing was the leader of Helena's Chinese community. And he's got this difficult situation. Do I help them catch this Chinese man who's gone on the run, who absolutely killed this white miner? But the circumstances are debatable. Do I help? the white authorities catch him, or do I help him get away? And so Tong Hing was caught in this difficult spot. I think Chinese New Year played a role in this. The killing happened on January 15th, 1870. Chinese New Year that year was gonna be January 31st. And I think Tong Hing was making some calculations of if we don't bring this person who killed this white man to the authorities, what might happen when we publicly and loudly celebrate Chinese New Year that year? The wife, it's interesting, she supposedly testified uh, just as the white man had given his side of the story. After he was shot, he, he dies 14 hours later with plenty of time to tell his side of the story. He, he stumbled from the Chinese man's cabin down to the Caillou Saloon and told all his friends what had happened. They then claimed that the woman was there and gave it just as the white man claimed. She couldn't speak English and she was in a room with the body of a man that her husband had just killed, surrounded by his mining partners. It's difficult to say. But Tong Hing had to navigate this situation. So he actually issued a reward for the, uh, the arrest of that person. And he's trying to be this go-between of a leader for the Chinese community, but also have these connections with the white community, kind of like Dr. Hui Pak in Butte. In 1872, for Chinese New Year, Tong Hing entertained the leading white prominent businessmen of Helena for Chinese New Year. And it was noted that he did so with his usual urbanity and courtesy. And so maybe by doing these things and having some cross-cultural connections, maybe that anti-Chinese rhetoric wouldn't flare quite so much. But it seems that Tong Hing wanted to have a role in both communities. And in fact, he did. In 1874, he was the only non-white member appointed to Helena's Committee of Safety after a number of fires had ravaged this part of Helena. And so he had risen in, in Helena's society so much that white business leaders and white city leaders started trusting him and empowering him for these various roles. Okay? I think he was trying to navigate the tensions between these two competing forces. We don't know exactly what happened to him, but to the question about how expensive it was to send remains home, Tong Hing also was responsible for that. He took the role in the Chinese community of arranging for the exhumation and repatriation of remains for reburial in southern China. And in 1875, to the tune of buying zinc coffins, $1,000 worth of zinc coffins in 1875 to do this. $1,000 in 1875, the dollar at that time period is about equivalent to $35 now. So he was serving an important role for the Chinese, also had this role in white society, okay? And so these are the areas that I've mentioned celebrating Lunar New Year today, and I've gone into depth on all of them except one, right? Nyhart. We've got Helena, Butte. Here we see the population spread across Montana as well. And now let's, let's look at Nyhart, Montana. Nyhart, Montana, population two Chinese men and other people. But the two Chinese men there, they, there'd been an attempt to boycott the Chinese in Nyhart, and they persevered and stayed. Then, in 1899, they leave for a bit. And it says, the Chinese men of Nyhart, in order to change their luck, did obeisance to the Josh and observe Celestial New Year in Helena this year. Tom Gong and Li Ji got back Monday and chattered the delights on the occasion. How far is it from Nyhart to Helena in the spring of 1899? That's a journey that tells me that this mattered to them, that it was important to them, 
to keep alive that cultural continuity, to show strength, to keep the spiritual traditions alive, even in the midst of an often hostile environment. There'd been an attempt to boycott them a couple of years earlier, and yet they kept their Chineseness alive. If you would like to take part in this, coming up this Saturday down in Butte, celebrated by the Maywa Society, is the annual Chinese New Year Parade. It's described as the coldest, loudest, shortest parade in Montana. <laughs> and we go around and we collect uh, collections and things like that. Last year I was on the Bucket Brigade and just, you know, people would put in a dollar or two and things like that. And it was so windy last year, the money was just flying everywhere. So maybe the windiest parade in Montana as well, although I think parades from my home town of Great Falls might compete for that. So that's going to be this Saturday at 3 p.m. at the Maywa Society in Uptown Butte. It's a wonderful affair. It's a lot of fun. And if you haven't been to the Maywa Society's building, the Maywa Museum, it's a wonderful way to try and preserve and tell this important part of Montana's history. I hope that I've added a little piece of this uh, preservation of Montana's history and telling it through tonight, through the article that's recently out in Montana, the Magazine of Western History, and through my book, The Middle Kingdom Under the Big Sky. Thank you for your attention. I think we've got plenty of time for questions. I think we had one question coming up. Correct. It starts on the steps of the courthouse, so about a block further south, further uptown from where the Maywa Society is. Yep, good, good point. If you do have a question, can I bring the microphone to you so our folks that are, uh, we're taping this, so our folks at home will be able to hear the question? I think we got the first question up in the second row. Actually, it's not a question, it's a comment. Please, That's please. Okay. So nothing in your materials mentions Haver. Mm -hmm. I, I know for a fact that there, were, there is a Chinese population, was a Absolutely. Chinese population yep. in Haver. And if you look at the Sanborn map, for 1903, mm -hmm. you can see kind of where they were living. Yeah, yeah. And it's really close to where my grandparents ended yeah. up. So, you know, back in the 1950s, I knew of at least 16 p Chinese people yeah. living in Hel uh, Haver, Montana, half of which was our family. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> and I, don't, I can't remember what number I pegged for the map at, at Haver at its height. You're absolutely correct. And along the High Line, along the railroad area, the Chinese were very important in building the railroad and restaurants yeah, and ours was services. A yeah, we had a restaurant. Yep. So, um, yep. but anyway. what, do you, what do you think about um, the frequent stories of the Chinese tunnels and Chinese underground experience in Haver? Okay, the underground, um, the underground in Haver was the result of a fire mm -hmm. that burned down all of downtown Haver in 1904, yep. January of 1904. So they weren't all Chinese businesses. They were yep. just businesses that had to have a place to go, and that, those were their basements. Yep. And so they just went down there while they... They had no building codes, and they didn't have a fire department, and I think they had a bucket brigade yep. to try to bring water from the Milk River, which was about a half a mile yeah, away. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and it was all stick-built structures, because all of that up there, you know, if yeah. you look at the Sanborn map, they're all yellow. Yeah. And the subsequent Sanborn map, everything is in blue or yep. pink, so it's either concrete block or cement or brick. So. There was, in the exhibit for the downtown um, underground haver, there's only one exhibit that shows, and it's, we're not really sure this is accurate, my dad doesn't think so, but it's, they claim that there was like um, a, um, an opium den down yeah, there. Yeah. I'm not sure that's really true. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, it burned down the, what would have been the boarding house for yeah. um, the Chinese people. But yeah, that underground had nothing to do with being Chinese. I, I agree. Here's what you mentioned in the Sanborn maps. They, they were color-coded based on the materials used. This is for Butte. What was just being mentioned was up in Haver, but that color coding was based on the materials. I've heard that up in Haver, and you know, this, this idea of Chinese tunnels is a persistent idea throughout the American West. It's a myth. It's a myth. Uh, I think people like the secretive nature of it and oftentimes in the absence of records and stories and family connections like you just shared what people tend to fill that gap with is mythologizing a lot of stories about tong wars a lot of stories about chinese tunnels a lot of stories about opium dens a lot of stories about every chinese woman in the west was a prostitute there's truth to every little element of that but it's it's very much over um, exaggerated i've heard some people say that for instance in butte there were chinese tunnels there there are not uh, because it was so dangerous to be Chinese, they couldn't live above ground. Absolutely not true. You can see that at times anti-Chinese re rhetoric flared, absolutely. But in, in Butte, there was a Chinese militia training with 
live ammunition and rifles in 1905-1906 to try and go back and retake China from this uh, pretender who had acceded to the throne. But it wasn't, they weren't hunkering and cowering in Chinese tunnels and things like that. I have, the people up in Haver um, have backed off those claims a little bit in the last couple of years about the titillating nature of Chinese tunnels under, underground. And it's interesting, the story you tell about fire and then kind of the first floor being moved down. Same thing happened in Seattle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it was January. You know, yeah. Zero. Mm -hmm. So a very important community up, up on the High Line in Haver, absolutely. Uh, the railroad story I didn't work to tell and the railroad towns I didn't work to tell in my book, I feel like that's been told in other sources, and so I didn't want to retrod that ground too much. So I tried to do new, but I didn't mean to, to disrespect the Haver Chinese experience as well. Great. Any more questions? Back here. Oh, I have to duck. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much. I mean, this you're just opening a door. To <laughs> so a couple, I've asked, I guess I have three questions. One is, you said there was these 300 letters. Yeah. So in your book, I'm guessing a lot of the material is what you kind of, the letters led you into places that you followed up on. Yeah. And then, uh, obviously, the Chinese that, that did stay and weren't pushed out have flourished in their own way, and I'm not, how far do you go in your book in covering kind of the stability of the Chinese that stayed? And the third thing I'm really interested in is uh, we know about the Chinese gardens, but how significant were Chinese gardens to fresh vegetables in these Montana communities? Yeah, I'll answer that last one first. I'm doing a project next. I've got all these pieces that didn't quite fit the framework of the book, you know, to tell the experience of the Chinese in their own words when possible or through a global lens. And that was the manuscript that got turned into the book. I've got these other things that I call manuscripts, <laughs> right? And so I've got an idea to do a, a study on Chinese gardens. There were Chinese gardens in most communities. Helena had important Chinese gardens here that, like you said, absolutely provided fresh vegetables to the mining community. Uh, you know, the American West, as it was settled, was, it was quite male dominant. And so some more traditionally feminized work fell to communities that were kind of economically uh, marginalized. So Chinese in laundries, Chinese in restaurants, Chinese in gardening. They were absolutely important. And I, I find references to them being very respectful and noting how they could make Montana flourish in ways that was just unbelievable with fertilizing technology, with irrigating technology, with greenhouse and hothouse technology. So I'm going to be looking into that next. In terms of those who stayed, there are some Chinese families, Chinese American families who persist in Montana. Absolutely. We've got some representatives from them tonight. If they would like to say some words, I would be fine as well. Sadly, as you saw from that map, it's peak in 1890 and then it's precipitous decline. Um, a lot of times that story is told in a very passive, ho-hum kind of way. Like, oh, they were here, but they never intended to stay, and so they went back to China, or they moved on. Sadly, it was far more active in the anti-Chinese expulsion than that. The period 1903 to 1906 was particularly difficult in Montana, and Montana's Chinese population declined by about 30% during those three years, with arrests, with deportations, with the inability to bring witnesses or to challenge that, those governmental actions. And so that was a sad time and a, a precipitous decline. I do tell in chapter eight of, a, of a, a Chinese family's experience here and how it pulled them out of Montana because one Chinese brother got into Butte in 1933, and then he desperately tries to get his other brother who's stuck in Southern China to join him in Butte, and the paperwork is never ending, and the changes of the laws are never ending. And so finally, he decided to leave Butte in 1957, relocate to Seattle, because there were so many governmental requests for a new blood test, a new this, a new that. And so his family now continues in Seattle. For my research purposes, thankfully, he left 250 letters behind, 250 documents behind, attesting to his desperate attempts to get his brother out of southern China to safety in Montana. His brother was never able to be, re the brothers were never reunited, but the brother who'd been here in Butte made a life in Seattle. Yeah. Now, to those letters, your, your first question, 
the first collection of letters we found, uh, and I say we because I was teaching in Shanghai at the time, I don't read Chinese enough to read these letters, and so I needed the language abilities of my students, my Mandarin teachers, my students' parents and their grandparents, so it was a really intergenerational project. Those first collection of letters were from the 1880s to 1920s time period, all from southern China to a guy working as a laundry worker in Butte. Now, of course, we know he was writing back to his family in southern China, but by definition, those letters are in southern China. So we've got a one-sided account, but it does testify to the pressures he was under. And those letters are heartbreaking in terms of send more money, send more money, send more money, come home and get married, send more money. <laughs> Right? It's a cultural imperative to produce descendants. And yet, I think he was probably here under an assumed name, under a paper identity. And I think if he would have gone home to try and marry, his status to try and get back into America might have been compromised. So he was constantly uh, beset by these. And it were, they weren't just polite requests of, we would like some more spending money. The money earned here was keeping family alive in Taishan County, Guangdong province. He was a laundry worker, and they write to him saying, we know your hands are bathed in gold. <laughs> Comparatively speaking, they were, compared to what the family was going through in southern China. So that first collection was the 1880s to 1920s. The second collection was the 1930s to 1950s of those two brothers trying to reunite, trying desperately to reunite. That's fascinating. Did you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I have a comment and a question, and going back to the Chinese tunnels, I know in Helena, the tour train, they used to say that the Chinese would mine at night, like after yeah. they, they did. I, I don't know if they still say that. I'm curious if I that's don't know a if they still myth say or that. not. Yeah. Um, anyways, I was just curious if that was a myth or not. But my question is uh, maybe kind of controversial, but what's, your, what's the best Chinese restaurant in Montana, in your opinion? <laughs> It's a good question. So we used to have the House of Wong here. We used to have Yatsan's wonderful, wonderful family connections back to time periods from the past. Wonderful cuisine. Uh, down in Butte, there's a very interesting claim. I, I won't say it's the best, but I love this historic claim. And it's, it's great food. But the Pekin Cafe, the Pekin Noodle Parlor, has a claim to be the longest continuously operating Chinese restaurant in America. Let me state that again. In Montana, we have the longest continuously operating Chinese restaurant in America. I hope to go there on Friday night. I'm giving the same talk down in Butte at the Isle of Books, and then my son and I are going to go to the Pekin Cafe, stay overnight at the Miners Union Hotel, and then do Chinese New Year the next day, the parade there. So we've got some wonderful, wonderful historic Chinese, uh, Chinese restaurants throughout the community. Interestingly, in Bozeman, there's a woman from Shanghai, and she's a newly arrived Chinese immigrant. Uh, but she runs a pop-up kitchen called the Hummingbird, the Hummingbird Kitchen. And her meals are quite authentically Chinese, whereas the other restaurants are authentically Chinese-American. I know sometimes we can get kind of nitpicky about that. It's a cuisine that developed in a historical time and place for certain reasons. Uh, and so I think sometimes we look at it and say, ah, oh, chop suey is not really Chinese. It's Chinese American, and it's from the history of these people and what they did here and what they had to go through here. Um, but the Hummingbird Cafe, Hummingbird Kitchen, I think, in, in Bozeman, is very authentically Shanghainese food and a very different than what you're going to get from some of the Chinese American restaurants. All wonderful. You're making me hungry. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? We have time for one more. All right, I think we've got two more, and these uh, lovely okay, ladies, I'm not we'll, going to say no. We'll take two more. Um, what was the level of literacy? Um, it sounds like one person was doing a lot of letter writing in Butte. Yeah. How many people were literate, and how did that work? It's a good question. What's the level of literacy for the Chinese migrants coming in? And you might mean literacy in English no. or literacy in Chinese. Uh, the literacy in English was quite low early on, as you might imagine. Um, but even that, that guy who killed John Bitzer in 1870 in the affair that happened over here in, in Helena's Chinatown, it was said that he spoke English tolerably well. He had an interesting habit of running his tongue side by side in his mouth as he spoke English, which helped in his rewards, right? But, but he could speak English pretty well. In terms of Chinese literacy, there probably was at any of the Chinese merchant shops or Chinese apothecaries, somebody whose job it was to be a scribe and to be the letter writer. So you'd come and verbalize that and they would put it in the Chinese characters to be sent home. But what we're finding now is the Chinese migrants who came over were surprisingly literate in Chinese. So I know it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, 
the Chinese workers who had enough capital to come over and try to earn more here were not the most destitute of those in southern China. And so they did have more access to literacy. Good question. And our last question, take us home. I was wondering about, do you have any information of those that might have went out to British Columbia, uh, those, those Victoria, that area? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So British Columbia and north of the border, important Chinese communities up there. In, in Alberta, absolutely Chinese communities as well. In British Columbia and Vancouver and specifically Victoria, there's an interesting story that does connect to Montana. So there was this uh, turmoil in the 1890s back in China with the Qing Dynasty. And some reformers tried to modernize the Qing Dynasty, westernize, modernize, do away with the Confucian exam system and adopt an, a modern military and a modern education system. Those reformers uh, were put down in a coup and all but two of them were beheaded. The two who escaped were some of the most brilliant Confucian scholars in all of Chinese history. Their names are Kang Yo Wei and Liang Chi Chao. They escaped to Victoria, British Columbia, where they started something called the Chinese Empire Reform Association. So they continued to try and reform China, but from outside. And so they made their first branch of that in British Columbia. My assertion in chapter four of the book, which is on sale after the talk, um, <laughs> is that the greatest critical mass of branches of the Chinese Empire Reform Association in the world was in Montana. There were 12 branches of the Chinese Empire Reform Association in Montana. One here in Helena, definitely in Butte, one up in Marysville on the way to the ski hill. So these Chinese people in Montana were actively engaged in trying to remake China through their experiences here. And if China could be made stronger, maybe their status abroad would be protected even more. So they were connected. But back to my first point, you know, I tried to tell the story of the Chinese in Montana in their own words, and then also through a global lens. I had to understand world history, Chinese history, to understand this reform movement and these exiled leaders, but then also Montana history to try and bring all of this together. It was fun work, it was hard work. I hope I did it well. You can be the judge. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Mark. That was, that was amazing. And I will say it this time, Mark's book is on sale over here from the, the Historical Society store. You do get a free magazine with it, plus you have the author right here to sign it for you. So we'll pull a chair over there for you. Um, just a couple announcements. Um, Thursday, we'll have Jennifer Hill here talking about birthing the West. And in February, I don't remember the dates off the top of my head, but we'll have Liz Gunderson, who is here with us tonight. The 9th, okay, February 9th. She's going to come and talk to us. This is our Valentine talk about the Holter Heart Monitor. And it's an amazing story. And then um, later on in the month, Lauren Hunley from Billings is going to talk to us about the Irish in Montana to celebrate St. Patty's Day. So, hoard on over here, <laughs> grab a book, and have this lovely gentleman sign it for you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't forget to pay for the book. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>